Yeah, they got it done. They survived. They came away with a victory at home. That's all that mattered. It was a Tuesday night. Washington was down a bunch of guys, but the Eagles came off an atypical bye week. I don't give a rat's ass how they did it. The fact that they come away with a victory against a divisional opponent also in the playoff race, that's all that matters. That's all that should ever matter. And shame on you for turning this thing into a negative that they barely beat or they should have lost. You know what? They did. You want to have a problem with the defense? Wait until we get to the three keys. But right now as we open things up, on post-flight, looking at this Eagles victory, necessary, must win to stay alive in this. You heard the broadcast, what they were saying, any team, whichever team loses, then now it's Washington, is SOL right now when it comes down to it as far as trying to figure out their odds, just making the playoffs. Eagles, on the other hand, are right there in the mix. They are in it. They are fighting for something. They are playing for something. Miles Sanders doing something we haven't seen since LaShawn McCoy. Two straight 100-yard games. This is what we wanted to see. Remember, at the start of the season, Miles Sanders was healthy. He was available. He was out there. What are you doing? Run him, run him. Nick Sirianni said, no, I'm not going to run him. I'm not going to run anybody. I'm going to throw the football. And then all of a sudden, Miles Sanders gets hurt. And then the epiphany, this light goes off on top of the Nick Sirianni's head. And he starts running and he runs and he runs. And next thing you know, he's running more than Forrest Gump all over teams. And Miles Sanders comes back and we think, is this going to work? It's a guy in a doghouse. What's going to happen? How is this going to whole play out? And you know what? We have seen it culminate now two straight weeks in which Miles Sanders is the vehicle behind this Philadelphia Eagles offense driving its way down teams' throats to success, and it is a thing of absolute beauty. And Jalen Hurts, after that first quarter of just it was up and down, the fumble was rough, the interception, that goes off a man's heel. Do you understand what the outlier is in the NFL? That defines it. Something that happens so frequently that you never, infrequently, pardon me, that you never count on it. You never bank on it. The likelihood of an interception like that happening again is not zero, but very low. So no, it's not that he threw an interception. It's, oh man, that's just bad luck. That's a brutal beat. They only held Washington to 10 points because Garrett Gilbert's just not that great of a quarterback. Jalen Hurts, on the other hand, is a very good quarterback in the NFL. He is a dangerous quarterback. He was making some throws, not all the throws, but he was making enough throws. And Dallas Goddard to Jalen Hurts to Dallas Goddard to Jalen Hurts to Dallas Goddard is a thing that I want to see each and every week. Devontae Smith, okay. Jalen Rager, good game. We've seen three and four. 16, 17, 18 shots dating back to last year. But you know what? He's there. He was present. Greg Ward with a hell of a catch with a great throw from just right there. I would say that would be the big thing. Just a second, though. When you look at everybody else outside of what Dallas Goddard and Jalen Hurts can be, and I think Devontae Smith can get to this point. It just doesn't seem to be in the cards right now. Doesn't mean that the kid isn't super talented. We know he is. This is crazy when you look at the one, two, three punch you're getting now from the Philadelphia Eagles offense. You have a quarterback that is super dynamic, that can run as well as any quarterback in the NFL. You have a tight end who should be a volume receiver that also can get you big yardage and a score, we know, or two. Dallas Goddard should be targeted double digits every week. He should be targeted the same way that the Raiders target Waller, that the Chiefs target Kelsey. When you look at Dallas Goddard, he should be targeted like a number one tight end in the NFL because he can play that way given the volume. And it's, what are you going to take away targets from? Jalen Rager or Quez Watkins or Greg Ward? Okay, I'm okay with that. That's the one punch right there alongside, as we already mentioned, the dynamic quarterback in Jalen Hurts. And then you have Miles Sanders on the ground who can just kill you. Yeah, Jordan Howard, Boston Scott, Kenny Gainwell, there are other backs. But Miles Sanders was always the best. We knew Miles Sanders was always the best. And he shows it now two straight weeks, how he, how Goddard now this week, and continuing to be with Jalen Hurts, so dynamic on the ground and a volume receiver, even at the tight end spot, that is really difficult to slow down. Yeah, Washington, Washington, the COVID, the issues, the guys that were down, the coaches, it was a Tuesday night game. I don't care how you win it, you get the hell out of there with a victory. 
treat this just like a Thursday night game, a short week, and they're going to have one on Sunday with the Giants. We'll touch on that before we get out on this show, but understand the biggest thing from this team is that they survive a short week is that they were able to get now three games in 13 weeks, games in 13 days. They were able to do all of this because when you look back on Tuesday night, they survive. You lose this game to Washington, your season's over. You've been gutted from the inside. That's it. Let's say it. One thing that I absolutely love about Jalen Hurts is how dialed in he is. And as bad as Mark Sanchez was on the broadcast, it was a thing of beauty to see Jalen Hurts and the reference from Sanchez two times over about how Nick Sirianni is basically like, hey, man, you can smile now. It's okay. Like, you can exhale. You, you can breathe. You can enjoy this moment. Because Hurts is so dialed in. Like, this is the competitor that he is. If you've ever heard anybody use that awful cliche of somebody not being a Philly guy, yeah, he's not a Philly guy. Let me tell you something. Everything that Jalen Hurts exhibits, everything that he stands for and then exhibits out there as a competitor, doesn't mean that he's going to make the right play or right decision or right throw every time. I'm saying as far as effort and attitude is exactly what this city is about. The cliches that come from being a Philly guy and the fan base that always pines for that. You've got one here in the quarterback. And as much as we've made fun of people like Eli Manning with the Manning face and just, you know, always having this weird doofus look on you no matter what. I mean, hey, you just won the Super Bowl. Oh, we won the Super Bowl? Cool. Okay, what do I do? Am I going to go to Disney World with my brother Peyton? Great. Okay, he just looks weird. He looks off, right? Meanwhile, Jalen Hurts, you won't even get such as a smirk after he completes a huge pass or rushes for a second touchdown, passes Michael Vick as the all-time leader, Eagles rushing touchdown. You don't even get a smirk, a smile, an acknowledgement. It's just... Back to work, back to work, back to work. I love that about this kid. I can't get enough about that from Jalen Hurts. Let's do it. Bring in Jimmy Kemsky at Jimmy Kemsky. Everything Philadelphia Eagles that you need to know from the draft to looking ahead to what happened from rookies to vets, including, of course, I'm sure Jalen Hurts is going to pop up in his columns this week. Jimmy, first and foremost, appreciate you, man. I, I know it's a short week. It's a crazy week for the team. That also means for people like yourself, who are covering it, uh, any immediate takeaway from Tuesday night football from the Eagles as far as the offense, the defense? Like, what was the first initial takeaway from you when that final gun went off? Well, as we know, uh, I mean, not to discredit the win, but obviously Washington was extremely depleted. They were without, you know, not just their top two quarterbacks, um, but they, you know, lost Ryan Fitzpatrick their original starting quarterback for the season when he had uh, surgery for his hip. So they were down Ryan Fitzpatrick. They were down Taylor Heineke. They were down Kyle, uh, Kyle Allen. And they're starting a guy in Garrett Gilbert, who they signed off New England's practice squad four days ago, four days ago from, from game day, that is. So, I mean, that's a huge advantage uh, in the Eagles' favor, obviously. They're missing uh, their all-pro uh, right guard, Brandon Scherf. They're missing, you know, some, some guys along their defensive line. They're missing uh, Kendall Fuller, their starting cornerback. They lost William Jackson, uh, their other starting cornerback during the game. They were without uh, starting safety, uh, Cam Curl. And the list just goes on and on and on. So, I mean, this is impressive that you have them all from the memory. I got to be honest. What's that? I I'm sorry. I was going to say, this is really impressive that you just reeled them off like that <laughs> off memory. Well, I mean, I've been tracking their, uh, you know, COVID cases and their right. injury report for pretty much nonstop for like the last nine days. So like, if I don't remember them, then there's something wrong with me, but uh, yeah. So like they, they were really, really depleted, obviously and give the Eagles credit for, you know, bouncing back after that, you know, zero 10 start to the game that, you know, with weird circumstances, the ball bounces up. Dallas Goddard drops the ball, bounces off his yep. heel. They pick it off. Really should have been a pick six. They score on that drive anyway. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they, they give them credit for rebounding from that slow start. And my immediate reaction in terms of positives from this game is that really not only in this game, but the last seven games, they are absolutely 
destroying teams in the run game, both offensively and defensively. So over the last seven games, and I think I have this number right, they're outrushing their opponents 1,501 yards, 1,501 to 554 on the ground. That is an insane disparity uh, in terms of what the Eagles are doing on the ground versus what they're allowing on the ground defensively. It's insanity. And, you know, it's been consistent to your point. And, and granted, I know the offenses have not been great as far as who they're going up against the quarterback scenario over the last yeah. month, really, and, and change. But the, the one thing that hasn't changed at all on offense, and I think we all maybe, I don't know if you felt it, but somewhere in the back of my brain, after 10 nothing in the first corner, uh, quarter, uh, I'm thinking, oh, man, here we go. First part of the season, Sirianni is going to come out and Jalen Hurts is going to throw the ball 50 times. And it, But, yeah, you're right. I mean, these are outlier turnovers. We'll never see an interception like Dallas Goddard's off yeah. his heel again. And they stuck with it. And I think that's the, the biggest relief slash sense of accomplishment that this team has this year, Jimmy, is no matter what the circumstances are, they ain't moving away from their bread and butter, which is driving the football down opposing teams' throats. Yeah, it took a while to get there. They had some yes. curious game plans early in the season where, I mean, early in the season, I can remember after they played the Dallas game, Nick Sirianni revealed in his post-game press conference that they felt that they were going to have trouble stopping Dallas's offense, and their solution to that was to try to throw the ball a lot and get into a shootout with them, which just made no sense whatsoever. They had a similar game plan, I think, against the Chiefs the following week. And then at some point, I don't know what triggered the, you know, the move to the run heavy offense, but that's clearly their identity right now. And I think that, you know, a lot of the credit not only goes to, to Nick Sirianni for recognizing that, but also to Jeff Statland, who has really sort of molded this offensive line together. He's, by the way, in charge of the run game. Like he's the run game coordinator and uh, they're getting some really great performances out of guys along their offensive line. Like I think three guys are pro bowl worthy. Jason Kelsey is going to be there for sure. Uh, Lane Johnson, I think is worthy of a pro bowl bid. I think Jordan Mailata is worthy of a pro bowl bid. And then you have Landon Dickerson who didn't play last night, but uh, who struggled a little early in the season, understandably coming off an ACL tear and being sort of thrown in the fire week two after Brandon Brooks went down. But he's played really well. He and uh, Jordan Mailata on that left side. Dickerson is you know, 6'6", 333 pounds. Jordan Mailata is 6'8", 365. And they're just a massive <laughs> bulldozing wall on the, on the left side of that line. <laughs> They've had a lot to do with you know the Eagles' success on the ground. But when you have guys like Jalen Hurts and Miles Sanders and Jordan Howard running behind it, you have three different kinds of runners. So they can, uh, you know, they can do a lot of damage to these defenses, and they have. They're the number one rushing offense in the NFL, and and it's by a pretty wide margin at this point now, too. Yeah, it'd almost be surprising if you look at how bad the Giants are against the run. We just saw Washington, who gave up over 100 yards to Sanders that made it two straight games. It'd almost be surprising now if when we head into that Dallas game, Jimmy, we're not looking back and seeing four straight 100 plus yard games for Miles Sanders. And look, it, it, to your point about it took a little while to get this running game going. It's finally this marriage of Sanders and how much they're running the game, right? Because start of the season, they were throwing, they weren't using Sanders really much anybody. Then he gets hurt, they start running the football. And now it's like, okay, everything is in sync. He's clearly this lead back and they have that. Hurts is another punch on the ground. Would you be surprised if Sanders doesn't clip 100 now, two straight games? So I remember, uh, you know, going back to that Dallas game again, they had like three rushes with their running backs the entire game. I think that's, I think I have that right. Yeah. 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 So, you know, it just goes back to the point that they've sort of figured that out. But yeah, I mean, Sanders is, is becoming a big part of the offense once again. Um, he actually got taken out in the fourth quarter at one point. Uh, he categorized that as you know, the, team, the team wanting to keep him fresh for the stretch run in, you know, a game that, they were yeah. leading by 10 at the end of the game. But, you know, they have a nice combination of, of he and uh, Jordan Howard like they had in the uh, the 2019 season where they sort of rode that uh, to the playoffs or 2018, 2018, 2019. They're all running together. <laughs> but those those two guys <laughs> are, uh, you know, they, they complement each other well in that Sanders is a little more explosive. They had a lot of outside runs with him 
uh, last night against Washington, whereas Jordan Howard's going to do a lot of your dirty work uh, on the, you know, in between the tackles. And then, of course, you have uh, Jalen Hurts, who keeps defenses honest. Even when he's handing the ball off, he's sort of negating one defender who's got to basically account for uh, Hurts keeping the ball and, you know, not running around the edge. So, the, the the run game is just working right now, whether they're running power looks, whether they're running, you know, RPOs, whether it's sort of, I mean, they even ran like an option play last night. So they're doing it in a lot of different ways and they've been highly effective. And it's really, the, I mean, it's their formula right now. It's, it's their identity. It's their formula. And they're back to 500. They're seven and seven. They got a chance at the playoffs. They get the right matchup in the playoffs. Who knows what can happen? No, it's amazing. And and like, I know like 70% of the league is in a playoff hunt right now, but it keeps you honest as a team. It keeps you showing up and it gives you something to fight for each and every week. I, one question on the game and then one more just on Jalen Hurts moving forward. But I am curious your thoughts on Fletcher Cox, the game that he had and really the defense, but Cox, his performance kind of representing that defense. And look, I get it. Garrett Gilbert and whatever the crap that Washington yeah. threw out there, they still, you, you cover this league a long time. You know, that guys, no matter what string they are on the roster, nobody wants to go out and get humiliated. Nobody wants sure. to get embarrassed. So they're going to fight. And look, the Eagles defense showed up. I just wanted to get your thoughts kind of on Cox first and then the D as a unit. Yeah, well, as I mentioned early, you know, Brandon Scherf didn't play in this game. They're all pro right guard. So, you know, advantage in, in Cox's favor there. But I thought this was his best game of the season this year. As you mentioned, he had the sack and a half. But beyond that, I thought he was disruptive. Uh, he and Javon Hargrave really all night pushed the pocket, even if like, the stats weren't there for Hargrave. I think actually Hargrave shared uh, that sack with Fletcher Cox. He had a half sack. But they pushed the pocket all night. The Eagles got to get a little bit more out of their edge rushers because – the interior was doing their job. They're they're pushing the pocket back and not allowing, uh, you know, quarterbacks. It, they they didn't allow Garrett Gilbert to step up in the pocket uh, very much last night. And the edge rushers have to do a better job cleaning up when, the, you know, the, the quarterback isn't able to step up. So they got to get some improvement there. That's, in my opinion, their biggest – the quarterback discussion aside, whichever way they go with that, edge rusher is, in my opinion, very clearly their biggest – uh, off-season need and probably what they'll tar what they're most likely to target in the first round of the 2022 NFL draft. Uh, but I thought also, you know, the back seven did a nice job on uh, on on their receivers. Terry McLaurin is a major weapon in that offense, and he had the one big play. He actually got behind Darius Slay. That should have been a touchdown with a better throw, uh, but it was left a little short. Wound up being a 46-yard gain anyway. McLaurin made a nice play on that. But that play aside. He had one catch for five yards. So I think yeah. for the most part, you know, Slade did a nice job. TJ Edwards had a big pass breakup. He had a forced fumble that the Eagles weren't able to recover. He continues to, to be a guy that, you know, is limited athletically, but is so instinctive and so tough that, you know, he, he winds up making plays anyway. So, you know, the Eagles have a, a weird mix at, at, along their defense. And, um, you know, I, I think there's, there's something to build around there. They're not quite there yet, but they have some pieces in place and uh, I'm sure that they'll add to that to, to that group uh, and, and they'll spend some you know significant resources on the defensive side of the ball uh, this offseason. 60 seconds, Jimmy, on your way out. I'm just curious from the global standpoint here on this team. We're three games out of the final of the playoffs. We're talking about this Eagles team having a legit chance at the playoffs. And Jalen Hurts is leading the league's top rushing attack. Has he not locked this job up for at least next year? I don't think he's locked it up for next year. No. Um, I mean, last night was certainly a check mark in his favor. So after uh, uh, the, uh, during the bye week, I put together sort of a stock up, stock down game by game. Look at, you know, each of his individual performances on the season. And I, at the time I sort of determined that, you know, he had four games that were stock up. He had four that were stock down. And then he had four that were sort of just neutral. Uh, last night, he added to that stock up tally. So I, I would call it five, four, and four at this point for him. So, you know, I think what the Eagles are going to look at is, you know, I mean, we're looking at their offense right now, and we're super impressed by, you know, what they're doing on the ground, the way that they're just crushing teams in the run game. To be determined if the Eagles want to be that, 
going forward in 2022 and beyond, I mean, we all indications have 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 sort of said that the Eagles want to be a pass heavy team. Like they want to win through the air. They feel that that's the way that you have the most success in the NFL. And whether this season sort of changes their mind on that might determine whether they roll with Jalen Hurts going forward in 2022 and beyond, or whether they seek out, you know, quarterback this off season, whether that's by a trade for a guy like Deshaun Watson or Russell Wilson, or whether they look to draft a guy uh, in, in the 2022 draft, whether that's a guy like Matt Corral from uh, Ole Miss, or whether it's a guy like Kenny Pickett from uh, Pittsburgh. So yeah, I think all options are still open on that. Um, what I've seen to notice throughout the season is that when Jalen Hurts has a good game, we all kind of go, Oh, he's their guy moving forward. When he has a bad game, everyone goes, all right, he's done. So we're very reactionary from game to game. So, you know, he's got three left and we'll see how those go. And, and then we'll take sort of, um, I think once the Eagle season is over, we'll take sort of an overview look of what we saw from him throughout the year and, and probably be better equipped to make a, a, a full, uh, you know, more formed opinion on, on, you know, sort of what what his body of work was over a full season, as opposed to kind of going game by game like this. Thanks, Jimmy. Awesome stuff. You, you got it, man. Appreciate it. People survive. They get the win against Washington. Bizarre set of circumstances, not only leading up to the game, but even in the first quarter. So Matt Mullen, Evan Macy, want to make sure I get that right. Joining us once again here, the staple part of the program on post flight. Matt, Evan, always appreciate it, fellas. And that first quarter was absolutely bizarre, similar to the circumstances, I think, not in right down to the exact variables, but similar in the sense of bizarre that this game would even be pushed to a Tuesday night, everything that surrounds that. I can't imagine that either of you, Matt, that you've ever seen anything like that where an interception goes off a guy's heel like we saw with Goddard. Definitely a sloppy first quarter, but you know what? Things changed drastically after that. They did. And I think, you know, looking back on it, maybe we shouldn't have been so surprised that they came out flat after however many long, uh, you know, two weeks, basically, plus that they hadn't that they hadn't played um, and Jalen Hurts even longer than that. So the rust in the beginning, I guess, you know, going in, we were seeing this weak beat down opponent that we thought the Eagles were just going to come out and steamroll right from the beginning That didn't happen, but I do think that there were positive signs in that, you know, you can only take so much from a win over a team that's missing half of its roster, but they did regroup and they did bounce back and were a completely different team after that slow start. So I think all of that was definitely encouraging. Yeah, and it's, you know, this is an Eagles team that really, I mean, there were some big plays. There was that catch that that Goddard made and, and a couple other flashy ones, but I mean, they're rushing for, you know, almost 200 yards now. And this is a team that's going to, you know, take its time to do you in. So, I mean, for us to kind of expect them to jump to like a 21 nothing start, that's not really what this team is. And the turnovers, I mean, obviously the first one was completely, completely bad luck. And Jalen Hurts is going to turn the ball over. I don't think we saw anything that was particularly surprising but it did pay homage to the only other Tuesday night game that, that Philadelphia <laughs> paid. So it was kind of nice to instead in the minds of everybody watch just to give us a little scare because he loves to be scared. Yes, and thankfully Joe Webb's ghost didn't come out and rear its ugly head by any means. By, it, it, that's something to be positive about. And I think the rust element is clearly going to be the valid one that we point to in that first quarter. The one thing, though, that I was a little disappointed is the game plan on defense to not just attack this Gilbert kid until proven otherwise. And look, I I recognize that Jonathan Gannon has held two straight teams to under 20 points. And, you know, clearly from a scoring standpoint, whatever he's doing is working. Although I'd argue that guys are making plays more so than it's a schematic thing. I was a little surprised at that, Evan, that you're right, that the offense may not be geared to go up 17, 21, nothing right away in a quarter, but that kid should have been on his back in the first quarter way more than he was completing passes. I don't disagree that that would be nice to see, but Gannon's kind of shown he like the defense of like the game managing 
play caller and quarterback, and he just situationally will ramp it up, but he just kind of, you know, he has to play it safe. That's what we've seen. And I guess, you know, the idea was not to let this team that's, let's face it, not boast a lot of talent on offense uh, this week, at least to let, let them beat you. Don't let them embarrass. I guess they were putting so much um, confidence in. I think we talked about this in a previous uh, podcast, you know, the de- the offense being the best defense for this team. Once again, you're kind of seeing that. Just kind of do your job as as half assed as you can, and and then let the offense keep the ball and run the. Ball. Yeah, I I think there's definitely uh you know there's obviously something to their offense being their best defense, but I mean let's not forget you know they weren't putting the quarterback on his back constantly, and I do think some of that had to do with you know they didn't want scary Terry getting loose down the field and making the play you know and getting a bunch of yards all at once and they felt like if they could keep him limited and make him make the plays um you know they were in better shape and i think that proved out throughout the course of the game because when you look at their total yards and stuff and you know their first 10 points all came off of turnovers on short fields um so the defense actually did its job very well it wasn't flashy in terms of getting a lot of sacks and stuff but it did you know there was one stretch where they had five drives in a row where they combined I think for 34 yards so they were definitely getting them off the field quick they just weren't getting sacks out of it and let's yeah, give the defense a little bit of credit just Antonio Gibson in the first quarter it looked like he was going to have 35 fantasy points and they were able to kind of shut him down keep you know they got on the line of scrimmage a bunch of times i don't think they rushed for very many yards i don't remember the exact total but i mean they were able to kind of adjust and shut down the biggest threats on washington which is what they had to do right and and that has always been my main point of emphasis with the defense which is guys up front started and we've seen this again in other games the jets game where all of a sudden they just decide to stop the run And they're talented enough up front. Like Fletcher Cox had one hell of a game all around, stopping the run, especially pressuring the quarterback, as we saw. It just, it felt like, and I I don't think it should ever have felt this way. And and maybe I'm alone on an island here. And if that's the case, then correct me. But even though drive stalled, and even though they got off the field, and, and you know what? The end result matters more. I get it. Although it is against Garrett Gilbert or Gilbert Garrett, whatever the hell it still felt like there was a threat for him to make plays. It still felt like there was an opportunity. Like it didn't feel like he was completely lost until kind of that final drive. And again, ultimately I agree. I'll I'll concede guys that it didn't matter in the sense that they got them off the field, but I just can't shake knowing that if I have that feeling against better quarterbacks, it's going to come back and bite this team. Well, I think, I mean, some of that, isn't that just like the Eagles fan in all of us, or the, let's just say the Philadelphian in all of us that is always worried about, you know, some no-name scrub coming off and, and, and lighting the world on fire. Um, I think, Evan, to, to the point you just had, you were talking about their, their run defense and Antonio Gibson. He finished with 26 yards. It, felt, it feels like he had seven, five yards in that game because he had a yeah. big, big start, yeah. That's yeah, not. I mean, I just think Gilbert also know. threw 31 times. Right, right, but they were playing from behind after exactly. the, you know, after the second half. You know, they the Eagles went down and scored early in the in the third quarter, and they were playing catch up the rest of the way. Um, I was surprised that they uh, that they had him throw that many times, but I guess 31 in the grand scheme of things, when you're playing from behind, isn't a ton. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you know the defense did everything that that you could ask from them in this they held them to you know under 250 yards um and and it was a a, you know a complete performance 63 total rushing yards you know i'm not sure what more you could ask for well look i mean oh i'm sorry 10 point no go ahead go ahead evan i just wanted to point out matt may think of this it's kind of like a philadelphia thing i don't know if we're spoiled is the right term but the Eagles had these great offensive lines almost back to back to back. And it looks like we're on the cusp of being on some kind of a stretch where they have it again with Dickerson and Mylotta, et cetera. And there was the stretch where the defensive line was just a set machine, you know, year after year, after, you know, the 2000s teams with Don McNabb and then the teams later in the decade and then the Super Bowl team, Connor Barwin got like 18 backs in a season. 
So I feel like when the Eagles aren't generating five sacks in a game, everybody freaks out because we're it's kind of like a thing of pride. Philadelphia is supposed to be the defensive that dominates, and that might just not be – they might not be a productive defensive line anymore. It might just not be the personnel we have. That's fair, but I also think to to put this in context, we've seen three straight games against – awful teams backups to third strings and the defense didn't get beat up. And I'm not, what I'm saying is I'm not coming down on Gannon, but I feel more neutral than I do feel praiseworthy. And look to your point about them not having the talent, maybe as, as we've seen, I don't think for me personally that I'm falling into like the Negadelphia trap here. You know, I go back to that chargers game and even maybe that Raiders game and think, all right, if you're getting circumstances that aren't going your way against a far better quarterback, is this – because I'm focused on the playoffs. Shouldn't we be focused on making the playoffs? Yeah, you got Glennon, whoever the hell this mess is at the Giants, and probably maybe Heineke back, who still technically is a backup. I don't know if Dak Prescott and the Cowboys are playing for anything, but if they are, then that's where I think – this conversation we go back to, and, and if I'm wrong, then I'll gladly admit it because that means the Eagles defense has been playing so well that they can shut down that Dallas offense. Okay, well, if you're, if you're looking at it that way, then yes, you're totally justified. I think I was sitting there thinking, you know, during this game, thank God they're playing this team right now and not someone with a legit NFL quarterback and all of their starters healthy because I don't know that <laughs> I don't think they would have come away with a, with a win. Um, so if you're looking at it, you know, looking ahead to when they have to play better teams, if you're looking at the playoffs or even the Cowboys, assuming they, you know, have something to play for that last week. Um, yeah, I'm definitely worried about the defense. From a defensive sense. standpoint only. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I think their offensive line and the run game, I am not worried about one bit. Yes, defensively, definitely. I think, you know, there's plenty of reasons to be worried about. I was saying you were having that uh, that Philadelphia worry for a guy like Garrett Gilbert beating them. But if you're looking Got down it. the line at more serious guys, then yeah, definitely there's reason to worry. And I don't think you can give too much praise to the defense. I do think you're right to be more in that neutral phase because just look at the competition. They've played the last three games. It hasn't exactly been the best. So, And they're not going to really have another test possibly the rest of the way. So I guess – you know, we'll find out. It's it's kind of weird, though, Evan, right? Because it's like you're damned if you do, damned if you don't, in the sense of, you know, you give up 35 points to the Jets. Everybody's like, fire Jonathan Gannon. You give up 18 points to the Jets and, you know, seven, what, seven, 13 technically to the Giants, and then now 17, 10 off turnover, points off turnovers. And it's like, you know, okay, well, Gilbert, Garrett Gilbert, Gilbert Godfrey, whatever the hell, right? I mean, you're looking at it that, so... I, I get it, and I don't want to reduce it to just one or the other. That's why I was trying to add a little bit of, of context there with Matt so that I don't want to sound like I'm coming down on the defense tonight. I'm not by any means. Oh, sure. I mean, I, I don't have a list in front of me. Uh, I made the screen full so that my glare is, is bad. But <laughs> I really don't think that the Eagles have had a good defensive performance against a good offense. I'm just like going through in my head the teams that they've beaten or the teams that they played well against. And there's really need for them to hang their hats on. Both sides of, of this team, they just can't play a full 60 minutes. And I think that comes with Great point. the fact that they're young, the fact that they have rookie coaches, they just can't. We've seen flashes of a team that's a playoff contender, and then we've seen flashes of a team that should have a top 10 draft pick. And, I mean, maybe it ends up being 60-40, you know, the playoff contender versus the sloppy, you know, yeah. eighth ball, and that's what we're going to end up with. Uh, but I think, you know, the multiple scenario is actually in play here, which is, I mean, whether you buy into Jalen Hurts, if he ends up being the guy, going forward and then they can use those first round picks and some of that app space to upgrade the defense then you might actually have something here so it's actually shaping up probably into one of the best case scenarios based on what we're seeing on the field so i feel pretty positive about both sides of the football honestly love it all right let's end on this now you guys can't cheat because there are two options here so I know that you have your own telekinetic uh, language that you're already communicating to each other here. Like, all right, you take one, I'll take the other. You can't do that. You have to choose based on your own 
merit and based on what you actually believe as opposed to just, well, if I take one, I know Matt is going to take the other, so I'm good. Realistically, if you could only choose one guy, all right, somebody's coming in here asking, all right, Evan, Matt, I want to know all about this game. Tell, give me one guy to best represent what happened tonight. I'm going to whittle it down for two. You have, we'll take Hurts out of this. You have Sanders or Goddard. Evan, we'll start with you. Which one would you have and only one represent this win tonight? You're giving us a choice, the same kind of guy, at least in my opinion. Maybe Matt will see differences, but both are extremely talented players who are not utilized enough and who make stupid mistakes. I saw both of them. I mean, Sanders almost put the football on the ground a couple of times. I'm not trying to skirt around the question. It's just, I love I mean, it. No, it's fantastic. Goddard, this is a Goddard great missed, answer. Goddard missed a couple of layups. I think they're act like you did a really good job. They're both really good examples of this team. They're guys who have a bright future, etc. I guess, I guess I would go with Goddard because he's under contract. <laughs> um, they, <laughs> and he's the future of the team. Uh, and, and that's a better outlook because my Sanders, I don't know what's going to happen with him. His, he's going to be a free agent soon. You see all these running backs on these huge contracts that get hurt. I, I don't know if he's going to be back with the team. So for, for longevity, I'm going to go with Goddard. But both are really good snapshots of this team. So there was my political answer. And I'll see what Matt says. Um, so first of all, Aton prefaced it with this whole thing of one of you don't have to take one and someone take the other. <laughs> so clearly I'm obviously going to take Miles Sanders here. Okay. But let me let – me, <laughs> That was going to be my pick anyway, and I'll explain in a second. But I also think you're definitely right because not only are they representative of the team in that sense, but tonight in the game, you know, 135 yards didn't get in the end zone, 130 yards didn't get in the end zone. Um, both had, you know, scary moments. You know, Goddard had the one that went off his foot. Sanders a couple times he almost put the ball on the turf. I will say Sanders right now is more representative of this team because I think their identity is a run first team. And I think the way they've been over the last six, seven games now, um, you know, he was hurt for a little bit of that stretch, but now I think you're really seeing um, him take over as the face of that uh, running attack. And I think, you know, that's what's been winning games for them right now. See, great answers all around. No issue there. Appreciate it. At Matt underscore Mullen, at Evan underscore Macy. Appreciate it, fellas. So the biggest thing to look ahead right now with the Giants game is just time. It's how healthy this team can be. It's how healthy bodies can return right now. And also, this is a short week. This is a super short week. One that anybody in the NFL, unless you've played a Tuesday to Sunday, can't really tell you how it's going to be. Here's the good news. And I want everybody to just take a breath right now. The New York Giants are toast. They're cooked. They are so bad as a football team right now. Mike Glennon is the quarterback. Unless Daniel Jones is healthy, this isn't even a conversation. In fact, I would go ahead and lay the 10 right now. I don't think it's going to drop much, so you're not going to lose a ton of value. If anything, it's going to move up. The Giants just can't get it right. It's been a waste with Saquon Barkley. Their offensive line is horrific. And even if Jonathan Gannon sits back with this soft shell, and allows Gannon to now Gannon to let Glennon throw the football, it's still not something that I would be totally concerned about because they don't have the horses. They don't have the quarterback. He doesn't have an arm anymore. It's a noodle back there. It's a disgrace watching this New York Giants offense even compete out there. It's not even like the Jets or just bad teams like the Jags out there, or Houston. It's not even like that. It's it's this team that looks like they haven't even put any effort into it. And guys are hurt. They're banged up. It's just a terrible display. They go out there. They bang into each other. The offensive line is atrocious. I'm sorry. Three games and 13 days aside, short week from Tuesday to Sunday aside, I'm going to be almost, not as equally, because this was a Garrett Gilbert special from Washington, but there is no way in hell that they go out and lose to the New York Giants two times this year. Uh-uh. I don't see it happening.